All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This morning, we're going into chapter 20 of the book of Genesis, chapter 20 of Genesis. In this chapter, we see Abraham going and meeting with another king, and he says something there that leads to some issues. We're going to go through and look at what is said and, and how God intervened in this particular situation. So if you want to open up to chapter 20, chapter 20 of the book of Genesis, first we'll get some music and then we'll jump into it. spread the word to as many people as we can. We try to help in any way that we can, any one that we can. We try to be in the night, standing in the gap to bring God's word. We truly appreciate you being with us today. And if there is anything we can pray for, we ask that you 
Yes, you can just reach out to us. Reach out to us through text, through email, messaging, and any way that you can get a hold of us. Let us know how <coughs> you need the nice day to look out for you. And we truly do appreciate each and every one of you. And now, here is today's message. All right. So if you'll bow your heads with me, please, we'll pray in, and we'll get into this. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we just come to you right now, Lord, and we ask that you fill this message. Let this message be your words and your will, Lord. We ask that this be what you want us to get from this. And, Lord, we ask that you give us some insight into some lessons that we can take out of this. Lord, we, we thank you for all the provisions, all the, all the blessings that you've given us. And, Lord, we just ask that you give us a blessed rest of the day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. Chapter 20. <clears throat> chapter 20 of Genesis here. And we start out, verse 1 of chapter 20 says, From there Abraham traveled to the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. While he lived in Gerar, Abraham said about his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. So he goes and he's living in this land. And it's, 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 it goes through it very quickly in this. And we don't know exactly how long. You could probably do some math to try to figure out and, and, and take some different verses. But it doesn't specifically tell us exactly how long he lived in that land before all of this started taking place, before he went to Abimelech, before he, all the rest of this in chapter 20. We don't know how long of a span of time, essentially, that chapter 20 took place. And it's kind of important to remember that as we end chapter 20. So he's living in this land, and he says to everyone about Sarah, this is my sister. And we know that he's done this once before. So he's telling Sarah to tell everyone that she is his sister and not his wife because Abraham is afraid, essentially, that the men would kill him to try to get Sarah if she's married. But if she's his sister then they'll just try to hit on her and possibly take her or whatever. So we continue here. It says, So Abimelech, king of Gerar, had Sarah brought to him. We can imagine why a king would have Sarah brought to him. And it's interesting to note, it's something that, that, that kind of hit me this time reading through it. Sarah is how old at this point? She's like 99, 98, something like, somewhere in there. So she's not a spring chicken. She's an old lady, but yet she still apparently is pretty good looking for the king to go, hmm, I'm going to have her brought to my chambers. She's apparently still pretty good looking. Something that just didn't quite hit me until I read through it this time of she's an old lady and she obviously still has something going on here. So Abimelech, the king of Gerar, had Sarah brought to him. But in verse 3 it says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, You are about to die because of the woman you have taken, for she is a married woman. God comes to Abimelech and says, uh, you got a married woman in your chamber. Uh, you, you're going to die if you touch her. She's married. So Abimelech, it says, now Abimelech had not approached her, so he hadn't done anything with her yet. It says he, hadn't, he had not approached her. So he said, Lord, would you destroy a nation even though, even, even though it is innocent? Didn't he himself, talking of Abraham, didn't Abraham say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. I did this with a clear conscience and with clear, clean hands. 
Abimelech's telling God, look, I didn't know. He told me that that was his sister, and she told me that he that that, that was his that was her brother. I, as far as I knew, they were brother and sister, so I had nothing wrong here. And verse six says, "Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that you did this with a clear conscience. I've also kept you from sinning against me." Therefore, I have not let you touch her. God says, yeah, I know. And that's why I came to you with the warning that I did as fast as I did, when I did, and as harsh as I did, to keep you from doing something that you didn't want to do. I came in here and told you, if you touch her, you're going to die because she's a married woman. She's married. So I kept you from touching her. Now, God says, now return the man's wife, for he's a, he's a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. He says, God's basically saying, now that you know, now that you know, return her to her husband, because now that you know, if you touch her, this is what will happen. Now that you know, now that you know, you need to return her. God says Abraham is a prophet. And Abraham was a prophet. So we'll see how, how this plays from here. Verse 8 says, Early in the morning, Abimelech got up, called his servants together, and personally told them all of these things. And the men were terrified. So now Abimelech is going and telling all the people that God spoke to him directly and about uh, the whole conversation and that if they, if anyone touched Sarah, knowing that she's a married woman, then they would be destroyed. And they're all terrified. They all fear the Lord at this point. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said to him, now Abimelech is approaching Abraham directly. What did you do? And he says, Abimelech says to Abraham, what, what have you done to us? How did I sin against you that you've brought such enormous guilt on me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should never be done. Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you intend when you did this thing? What? Why did you do this? What was your intentions? Why would you tell me this? What was your intentions? And Abraham replied, I thought there is absolutely no fear of God in this place. They will kill me because of my wife. So we can, I'm going to stop right there for a second. And let's think about this. Abraham was afraid that there was no fear of, of God in this in this in this land. They, they they didn't they didn't worship God. They didn't fear God. They they kind of were doing whatever they wanted to do. Because of this situation, God used this, and it says said right before the confrontation there. That when Abimelech was telling the people of the land about all the things in the conversation that he had with God, they were terrified. They feared the Lord. So even through this situation, even through this, this really weird miscommunication type thing, and we're going to get into to, to the miscommunication aspect of it. Even through that, God still used that to change the hearts of an entire nation. Now they fear the Lord. Now they fear the Lord. Something that was not really good was used by God to turn to good. But he also, Abraham continues in verse 12. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. <clears throat> 
So when God had me wander from my father's house, I said to her, show your loyalty, loyalty to me wherever we go and say about me he is my brother. Essentially, what Abraham is saying is, I didn't completely lie. It's partially true. I somewhat came clean. Partially lying is lying. And because of this lie, because of this, it led to a lot of things that could have easily been avoided. But even through that, even through that, God used it for good. Even through this lie that, okay, well, she is my, my half-sister, so I, I, I told you partially the truth on that. Not all of it, but I, 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 I didn't completely lie. I told you part of the truth, not all of it. Well, that's still, that's still a complete lie because you didn't say she's my wife and you let Abimelech take her to his chamber without saying, no, she's my wife. Was Abraham wrong in this situation? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. But that shows that even, even all of us, even Abraham, was not perfect. But when confronted with it, when confronted with it, Abraham came, came, came completely honest with everything. And he repented, and he he was making it right. He 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 was trying to make it right at that at, in that situation. He didn't continue down the path of of trying to lie about it and cover up and everything else. He came clean and and, and was repenting from that situation, and he made it right with Abimelech. The lie is what got this whole situation started to begin with because there was fear because there was there was a fear of of some sort of repercussion that would happen he abraham feared that if he told the people that that was really his wife that they would come after him and try to kill him so instead he tells a half truth or a complete lie, as it's also known as. A half-truth is a complete lie. He tells a half-truth because he's afraid to face any kind of consequences. And a lot of us will go through that at times. We're afraid to tell the truth because of fear of a repercussion, because of fear of facing a consequence because we're afraid uh, that if we actually tell the the entire truth that something will happen there'll be a confrontation there'll be a conflict there'll be some sort of of repercussion come back and that's a lot of us and, and I think every one of us has done that at some point at some point we've all somewhat been afraid to tell the entire truth because we're afraid of, of what will happen if we do. But it's in those times that we've got to face things. We've got to rely on God and have that, that courage and, that, and that, that faith that if we're doing what's right and we're telling the truth, no matter what it is, telling the truth is going to be better than trying to lie about something. While there may still be consequences for telling the truth, almost always the, the consequences are less if you tell the truth than they are if you try to lie about it. This lie that Abraham told almost had Sarah get, you know, violated by a king. It almost had Abimelech killed. It almost had the entire nation of Gerar destroyed because of this lie. Because Abraham didn't tell the truth. 
And if it wouldn't have been for God intervening in this situation, they would have been destroyed. But Abraham does come clean. He does open up and tell the truth about it. So in verse 14, Then Abimelech took sheep and cattle and, and male and female slaves, gave them to Abraham and returned his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, Look, my land is before you. Settle wherever you want. And he said to Sarah, Look, I'm giving your brother 1,000 pieces of silver. It is a verification of your honor to all who are with you. You are fully vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female slaves so that they could bear children. For the Lord had completely closed all the wombs in Abimelech's household on account of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And that last part, that last part as we closed out 20 was, closed out chapter 20 was why I mentioned at the beginning of chapter 20 that the span of time was, we don't know how long he was actually there, but Abimelech's wife and his female slaves could not bear children during this span of time until everything was vindicated and everything was, was, was set right. There was a span of time, and it had to have been a, a decent amount of time for them to know that nobody's getting pregnant. It had to have been at least a somewhat of a decent, a year, two years, somewhere in that frame. We don't, I'm not positive exactly how long it was, but he had to have lived in that land for a decent amount of time for them to realize nobody's able to get pregnant. Nobody's able to get pregnant. Otherwise, it would, you know, if he was only there for a couple of days or whatever, nobody would have really known that we cannot get pregnant. So, the span of time in chapter 20, we're not exactly sure 100% on how long that was. However, in chapter 21, we do get into the birth of Isaac, and there is yet another mention of ages. So the time that was in chapter that was spent in chapter twenty was not over a year or two. It was, it could not have been. While we don't know exactly how long it was, we know a generalist ideal. So with that, I'm going to close this one out. If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Dear God, we just come to you right now, and we want to thank you for this message. We thank you for the ability to share this message. And, Lord, we just ask that you are with us and guide us throughout the rest of our day, that you that you help guide our every step. And, Lord, we, we just ask that, we ask that this message reach those that need to hear it. And, Lord, we just ask for, again, a, a blessed rest of our day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. With that, I'll see you guys back Wednesday night Bible study, Wednesday at 7, Friday night lights, Friday at 8, Sunday morning service, Sunday at 11. Until then, I love you guys, and I'll see you later.